So we're heading off to Singapore now, I believe. That's which, the plan. So yesterday I was in Spain, and now I'm heading over to another right. favorite culinary destination, which right. is there Singapore, you go. There you go. There um, you go. which has become one of the most um, in-demand destinations for sake and shochu makers yeah. um, who are looking to expand their distribution um, outside of Japan. And it's a really dynamic market. It's a really adapter market that isn't um, confined by... Um, the traditions of sake culture. And so we're seeing sake and shochu um, being integrated into the market in really innovative ways, which I see as having the potential to expand and create further growth, not only in Singapore, but for Singapore to act as a template um, and a hub for further expansion into oh, Southeast is. Asia and Oceania, which is you know great news for all yeah. of us. So, and a lot of that, um, um, groundwork is being done by advocates yeah. in Singapore. There are quite a few. Um, we've, we've only got space to have three of them with yeah. us today, <laughs> but they are real, um, real innovators yeah. um, who are doing great things in various um, aspects of the food and beverage community. Yeah, so we're going to try. We've got we've got three gentlemen joining us here today. We're going to see if we can kind of get that trifecta here together and sort of examine why the heck is it that all the breweries are trying to get into Singapore right now and, and what that means. And so let's see, are, do we have a couple of, do we have three gentlemen on the line out there? Yep, one, one good. two, three, uh, one. three, yes. There we yeah. are. <laughs> I can, I can see uh, you. Hey guys. <laughs> Hi, Hi. Hi. Nice from Singapore. To see you. Actually, this is kind of a reunion because almost exactly to this date, I was in Singapore. Um, was on, it a year ago? Yeah, it was a year ago. Um, it feels just like yesterday, and I've still got the hangover, Eugene. Thanks for that. Um, <laughs> but it was a, a, pretty much a year ago that I was in Singapore, and I got to meet Sean for the first time. Um, it was a pleasure. Of course, pleasure. the Saka community tends to be kind of interconnected through social media. And I got to meet also Eugene for the first time, which was bizarre given you, Eugene's got such a long history in the Saka community. But unfortunately, I couldn't make it to Burnt In. So this is going to be my first um, hello to Neil. Hi, Neil. Oh, hi. Hello there. Pleased to meet you. Welcome to the Saka Future Summit. And welcome, everyone, gentlemen. We're going to be tag teaming. We've got um, Justin um, and I. We're going to be doing double master, master <laughs> controller. So because it's a really interesting um, session that we want to extract as much information out of you as we can. So Justin, would you like to do the introductions? Who are we talking to? Yeah, sure. So first, we got, so we'll kind of go around the horn here. Uh, first, we're joined by Mr. Sean O oh, over at the co-founder of the Beverage Click. And you guys do a whole lot of sake education. Um, you want to jump in and tell us a little uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, if, could I just share my screen just to do a quick introduction? Yeah, go for it. Let's see here. Okay, we got your access here, so you can share. Cool. Give me one second. There you go. Right. Yeah. So, well, once again, thank you for allowing me to do a bit of introduction, so I, I can I'll be able to put things in context, especially what I want to show. Um, let's see. There we go. Yeah, so this is me. I'm, I'm Sean O. I'm, I'm the co-founder for the Beverage Click. So it's a, a education company for the past five years. Uh, in a lifetime ago, I was a sommelier for Singapore Airlines. So I was in the service industry um, in and out for about 14 years. And then I did a stint, a short stint in distribution and brand management. Uh, more recently, I, I, I'm also a brand advocate for Johnny Walker. Um, I, I've done a couple of... Um, professional certifications uh, and myself as a judge on IWSC and IWC. Um, but I think, you know, a bit of a shout out to uh, the JSS because I'm also an alumni. You know, J thank, you for, thank you for organizing all this. And uh, pertaining to our services uh, as a company. So primarily we are a consultancy and training services and we do carry um, brand education products uh, ranging from wine, to uh, tea, to, to, to cheese, and uh, which leads me to my topic on, on sake because uh, we, we're currently the only school in Singapore that actually carries uh, WSET, SSA, and SSI. So uh, if you'd like to find out more, I mean, whoever is tuning in, you could just uh, 
check the uh, the QR code. And yeah, so uh, pertaining to this graph, and I would so I'm 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 trying to show a bit of um understanding of uh, from my point of view or at least our company's point of view of what the trend is like uh, whether on education or the phenomena and how possibly brands could actually capitalize on this so we have uh, you just using the past three years as an example since 2018 you know I think I think we can all agree that sake has kind of you know take on its own life and it's it's been growing rather steadily so in 2019 you, you see a well, a bit of a jump, uh, but uh, come 2020, and then, you know, we we start to see a huge uh, volume increase in terms of our classes. I mean, yes, it's it's we are also riding on the fact that you know sake is on the uptrend, uh, but as a company, we have did some form of um, investment in terms of infrastructure and even improving our trainers. So there is a huge increase in terms of uh, what can be done with with sake courses and you know deep down we are still selling a sake product if you think about it so i think in that sense um well putting investments in certain in certain uh in certain core essentials uh is is, is key um and on this slide so uh, what i want to say is that uh yes there is an increase in terms of what you know, there's uptrend, people want to know more, more about sake, but that does not necessarily translate to wanting to learn more or the desire. Um, yes, we, again, we are we're in COVID situation, people are not traveling, but I think the government has kind of uh, put a lot of things under control and Singapore is relatively safe. So with the combination of things like marketing and our company has been really uh, agile in terms of trying to adopt to to putting things online, you know, I, and I see a lot of uh, even sake brewers trying to trying to go do virtual tours and you know to to to, to outreach and to to reach a wider audience. And there's a lot of things that can be done. And just by looking at the numbers um, between 2019 and 2020, whereby 2019 wasn't even even a pandemic year, you know, it was a three time uh, the, the 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 increase was three times uh, in terms of uh, the number of students that actually enrolled for courses. So I think there's a lot that uh, can be done. Singapore's market is is really uh, is really booming and it's trying to uh, it's it's like a sponge trying to absorb as much uh, sake related stuff as possible. So you know I think there's a lot that can be done, and I think our my two counterparts uh, with Eugene and Neil, who were both uh, coincidentally both were um, you know, graduated from 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 our school, uh, they will probably have more insights to share. Uh, and I'm going to pass the floor to them. I'm going to stop share. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks a lot. There's, there's a couple of things I want to touch on, but I want to get around to mm. all, all of our participants here. So I'll kind of I'll we'll jump around to everybody real quick here, and then there's a couple of things Absolutely. I definitely want to come back and touch upon. Indeed, me too. Yeah. So why don't we throw the bat into Eugene? Sure. Um, well, first off, I just wanted to say uh, you know thank you to to Justin Saki and AJSS, everybody that's been involved. Uh, you guys have been working two days straight, so <laughs> this one's for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> we don't, we can't camp you, you don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> Completely failed. And, We're yeah. surrounded by sake, but nothing to how drink. Can, I should have sent you a text. Part, right, how could we have gotten that part wrong? <laughs> Just a minute, I'll, I'll get something sorted out. Well, anyways, uh, yeah, no, but thank, thank you for having us. Um, you know, I just wanted to say, uh, um, you know, I've been in the business, um, coming to four or five years now actually just a little just a little over five years so still still very new to the market but um, very glad to be able to contribute to to sake in Singapore um, and uh, it's a lot of it really comes from from the education so stuff that Sean is doing stuff that Neil is doing um, because we think about it they're the ones that are really contacting the, the final customer um, you know Sean works with with people that are on trade as well as final customers who are interested in sake and and Neil is right there on the spot where where they're they're they're, they're picking up the glass you know and, and they're making the decision to to let's try this sake or not uh, and, and I'm somewhere in the middle where you know well, we try and bridge the gap between between the brewers the brewery and getting the product out there 
so I think it's a really interesting uh, situation to be in be between the three of us. Um, you know, and, and, and not, not, to, not to do a whole bunch of stuff, but if I could just share a little bit. Um, I pulled this off the, uh, the Singapore Customs. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, there we go. So I pulled this off the Singapore Customs site, um, and it's it's just a, a a look at percentage numbers. So if you look at this 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 top line on top, that's where we have um, total volume of alcohol uh, duty paid alcohol coming into Singapore. And if you look at the lines below, we're looking at uh, sake. So that's specific sake growth, and Looking at that, you can see that sake is growing quite a bit over the last uh, 10 years. Pretty much straight every year, we've got high single digits to, to low doubles. Um, only 2018, there's a, there's a very minor dip uh, that doesn't, you know, doesn't really, uh, uh, doesn't really hit, hit the numbers too much. But you, you can see there's a huge interest in sake for the last 10 years. And um, I think that's, that's in no short to the efforts of, of people like Sean and and many of the other uh, importers, just distributors, and, and Japanese restaurants um, and, and sommeliers in the country that are starting to get interested and starting to, to want to um, include sake into their menus. Um, and at the same time, a lot of the chefs, uh, non-Japanese restaurants are starting to appreciate sake for what it is. So uh, much like what some of the conversations we've had, like uh, I, I watched in like the guy from Spain, the UK discussions, you know, it's 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 twofold. It's getting the sake first off into you know existing Japanese restaurants, and then getting them into restaurants which are decidedly non-Japanese, and and then bringing that uh, into the menu and, and onto the customers. So I think um, uh, hopefully you know we're all able to contribute a little bit to to raise the entire industry. Indeed. Well, that seems like a really nice segue to Neil, who can actually give us a little bit more insight from the F&B community about his um, experience and journey with sake. Do we have Neil there? Or All righty. Yes. yes um, hi, Mal. Yeah. Anyway, so pleased to meet you guys again. So thank you very much for like you know uh, giving me the chance to be part of this community down here. So I'm going to be more focus to the consumers, like basically restaurant customers straight ahead and probably some insights from the sommeliers as well. So like, as you all know, so I'm working for Burnett's, which is basically an Australian restaurant, modern barbecue. So like first perception of all is like, people wouldn't really think that we're doing sake, okay? So basically like, it, it, I think it's all, it, all, it all depends as well with the sommelier, like how are you supposed to introduce sake to your guests? Okay, so basically, like when people come in and then they were like, okay, yeah, we're gonna have a bit of like an aperitif and so on. Like, what I would come is like, oh, do you guys want to try off with you know something different? And there you get some touch points with the guests, and then you tell them, well, you have you guys tried sake before? And the first perception is gonna be like, hmm, don't really know what is sake, you know, which is I think I can pretty much relate because that's how I've encountered sake as well. So what I do is like I go down to the guest and then just pour a glass. And then the dialogue starts from there. And people are like, what is this thing actually? I was like, yeah, it's a Japanese, you know, Japanese beverage, you know, which is basically just, uh, made from rice, you know, f fermented beverage. It's like wine, but it's just made from rice. But how can it taste like this? And from there, instead of being a glass sale, it becomes a ball instead, which is uh, quite interesting to see like people are really more keen to know about like what what is this like mysterious beverage you know so as we all go so like and so on so we only have like a probably a few listings for sake in our restaurant well uh likewise so it, uh what we do is like we always try to relate to the common ground like common touch points for them so from there like okay we ask them like uh, do you guys are like more open to like something a bit more different something a bit more different and stuff and then, yeah, it's something like that. But how do you say, like, there's a lot of growth into the guests, like, what do they want and what do they need as well? So, like, sake, oh, let me just turn on my lights. I think it's getting a bit darker in my side. You, Give me a you, second, you're guys. You're getting a little bit. Um, <laughs> it is raining. Uh, <laughs> all right, there you go. Uh, it's suddenly a big rain. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. 
<laughs> okay, so uh, as I was saying, so so yeah, it's all about having the touch points with the guests as well, and how do they trust you as well? So me as like you know one of the frontliners, like how do you say it? Like you always need to know like the story behind it. It's not only about the general facts that you say about sake. I mean, I can talk all day about you know how it's made, blah blah blah. But what's the story behind it? Like, what makes sake something different from wine? You know, as like for me as a sommelier, like I train mostly for WSET, quarter of master sommeliers, and then you know, eventually I find myself knocking on Sean's door, like Sean, I want to know more about sake. You know, teach me more. It's like there's something more about this thing over here right now that I want to learn about. So yeah, that's uh, basically it for like you know just for for the grounds for for the restaurant. So yeah. That's really interesting because um, we're hearing a, bit, a really consistent yeah. <laughs> um, comment coming out from the F&B mm. market, um, as well as from educators, as well as from distributors. Mm. Um, but very strongly, we're hearing from the F&B community that what is, they really want is not data, not the polishing rate necessarily of the of the of the rice. I mean, if you say it's a 50% polished yamnishki, what does that mean in terms of flavor in the glass for the end consumer? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it, it does mean something, but you're not going to be all there all night with a yeah. slideshow explaining why. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. We want to have a more narrative driven um, mm. source of information to share with mm. the end consumers, what I'm hearing. And I, and I think you just touched on something. You've trained in wine and in training for wine, you are given that knowledge as part of your training. It's something that is very much um, Im immersed in talking about wine. It's as mm. natural as choosing a different um, glass for a different style of wine, talking about the, the, the background and the story, the terroir um, of that particular wine is very, very important. And I want to throw this now to uh, to Sean, because you are a wine and sake educator. Are you finding, did you find number one, that there was an absence or a gray zone of that narrative based information in sake education? And are you filling that gap with what you've learned by as being an educator and of wine and also a wine sommelier. I'm just wondering about those two points. Right, so uh, pertaining to, to, to the narrative, I think, uh, could, could you hear me? Is it, I, is I, it I can. A little more volume. Can we yeah. have a little more volume in the studio? Thank you, so sorry, sorry, off you go, Sean. Yeah, so pertaining to the narrative, I think that's really important because, um, in terms of what, I'm just going to do a little bit of a quote to, to John Sensei, uh, Mr. John Gartner. He did say that, you know, when it comes to, 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 to education content, they're always going to be the same, one way or another. I mean, there, is, there are similarities, but there's that romance behind the grand story and um, how people on the ground, they're actually communicating. So in terms of communication to, you know, uh, what's so unique about this particular brand or this particular sake, that's really key. That's really key. Uh, when it comes to wine and sake with that gray area, um, we, we live in very different times, you know, because people want to, 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 to know about the, the next biggest thing, you know, what's, what's the, the, the next frontier. We all try to explore um, um, drinking better, you know. Uh, so when it comes to, to, to wine, I think that market, and I think Wayne previously in the, the previous session, they, they mentioned that he, you know, they, he was practically the only sake guy in, in, in New Zealand. And because every, you know, you just pull somebody off the street and that person knows about wine. It's, it's kind of getting a little bit saturated. Um, and when, you know, it, to breathe new life into the drinks industry, sake is, is that new life. Uh, it's it's been on uptrend for the past few years. It, you know, it's just about how we target and 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 uh, you know and just extrapolate that that very the essential of how to make things work. So I'd like, like to take you back to my question though. So how can we, for example, Neil saying he needs more information and to be able to give that narrative based 
um, explanation to the end consumer and to create a more nuanced, um, you know, more intuitive way of talking about sake to an end consumer rather than data. How are you as an educator with, with um, deep knowledge in both of these areas, how, are you, what are you doing to um, fill that gap and providing that solution for your students? Right. So in terms of collaborations, I guess, um, whether is it online or even uh, in-person masterclasses, so we work with, we actually work quite closely with Eugene, you know, in terms of some of his brands, especially if, if I was to just uh, to quote one brand, uh, Daimon, you know, they have, they have a good brand story. They have good, uh, they've good, inter they've got a good international presence, but how do we actually communicate that to, to the ones that are, um, you know, the consumers whereby it's just so many to choose from. Um, so for us as educators, we are, we are directing or at least, I won't say shepherd, but kind of guiding them towards uh, this particular brand story or this particular brand. It's the exposure. Uh, and that burns down to my, my last, my second last slide alone about marketing. It's, it's, a, it's a key component to, 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 to invest in. But again, you know, it really depends on, on, uh, on budget, uh, the conditions. So that's my, that's my point of view. You know, I, I would like to take full credit for it, but no, it's, it's all burned down to the people like Eugene, who's doing distribution, uh, to Neil, who's doing this, you know, the service side, trying to, trying to get people to understand more about the, the sake. Right, so, I mean, I know Eugene, you have a deep, um, deep love affair for sake, which has been going on for many, many years now, perhaps even over a decade. And you are connected in terms of distribution with um, many wonderful breweries here in Japan. Now, I'm, I'm curious, we've, we're talking about how to, someone who, for example, is a distributor or someone who's an educator or someone who's a sommelier can um, communicate more information about the, um, the sake to Singaporean consumers to create more interest and value. So, uh, what are the what are the difficulties? Because I'm not sure that you, I mean, are the breweries that speak English are they the most easy to approach? Um, how is it dealing with breweries that don't communicate in English for someone who is in Singapore and is trying to, you know, um, create um, develop more distribution for breweries outside of Japan? Sure. Um, well, f first off, I mean, the, the language is, is a massive issue. I mean, I'm, um, I think first off, the important thing is uh, to the local market, um, it's clear, I'm not Japanese. I can't speak Japanese. I'm not pretending to be Japanese. Um, you know, I'm fully full-bred Singaporean. Um, so that when, when they meet me, they know that I'm not pretending to be something I'm not. But what I can be is a conduit between uh, between the Singaporean consumer, the consu at least the Singaporean restaurant, and the breweries in Japan. So, and to back on, into the first point, for example, uh, Daimon is great because you know Marcus is there. Uh, Daimon San speaks perfect English. In fact, I think he might be one of one of a very small handful of Kuramotos that are that fluent in English. Um, but it's great because we can have that personal connection. And, and we can speak and, and we understand each other. And, and that helps. With the other Japanese um, uh, Japanese breweries, that's when there's a little bit of effort coming in. And, uh, you know, with my, with my very limited broken Japanese, uh, Google Translate, uh, their broken English, we come to a common ground. And, and I think a lot of that is met with this, uh, this, at least this passion or at least this interest in, in their sake, and more importantly, not just the sake, but actually in themselves, in their business. Um, I've been very fortunate to visit most of the breweries that I work with, and not just hang out in the brewery, but I've actually met their wives. I've met their children. Um, some of them have met my wife. You know, we've had we've had dinners. We've gone out, um, and I think that really helps bridge that 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 language connection. That even though we may not really fully understand what each other is saying, but that that connection is built, and that helps me be able to 
ask certain questions and get to to know instead of just you know what number of yeast is this or what is you know uh, what what polishing of the rice or how long did you ferment this for if we get to ask certain certain questions like what were you trying to achieve with this with this label or this product or you know i taste this in this in this sake you know what is there why did it happen or um or your water source your water source why why does it affect the flavor in such a manner and i think these are the kind of stories and these are the kind of of efforts that when we come back uh and it's i'm able to translate that at least to some of the restaurants and some of the customers that gives it a little bit more of a uh, little bit more than just oh well jumai daigenjo yamada nishiki 45% it's going to taste like this you know but a little bit of more of uh, you know the the brewer left it for an extra couple more days because he wanted to dry it out um you know to to give that kind of mouth feel and, and i think that that gives a bit of a difference or you know or again for example like when we know that certain certain batches of rice uh, is for example i think last year's rice was a little dry um, it cracked a little easier and and things like that it goes it goes into the story uh, and 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 the end consumer does does appreciate that it just brings a little bit of romance to it um, i think sake at the end of the day uh, is a luxury product you know it, they're not going to buy it because it's cheap or they're not going to buy it because it's it's easy to to get they're going to buy it because they want to be invested in it or it means something to them and this product is going to bring the extra level of enjoyment to their evening whether they're in a restaurant or at home uh, and i and i hope that all these little things contribute uh, to to that experience thank you that's really thank you so much for that insight one one thing i'd like to say is I, I i guess we know that like that what you're saying sake is a luxury product in singapore we know it's because taxation is making the price point hit the market um at a level which is you know far and, be, and beyond what it is in japan so i just sort of wanted to for everyone um who's listening out there singapore does have quite high um tariffs and taxes um unfortunately but again these kinds of issues that's way above our yep. our um influence and yeah. sphere but um really really great um points that you that you threw out there and so really what i'm hearing from from you as well is as Sean touched on was this need for investment investment in marketing as well as investment in building relationships and knowledge um with international distributors educators um F&B um staff i mean it's we all know that sake breweries can range from the mega to the mega tiny <laughs> the micro mega to micro with you know sometimes just a few people um a few hands so there is there is obviously it's not a community that is like the wine community or the this um this distilled spirits community but i think it's really important to really underline that point that you're making both of you Sean and and Eugene that investment in your overseas markets is really essential for sustainable long-term growth as well as clear communication about brands and brand stories and purposes as well. So now what are the trends that you are finding in the um I mean because actually when I was in Singapore I noticed that people were actually quite knowledgeable <laughs> about sake. So I'm going to throw this to Neil because you're right at the coal face. What are some of the trends that you're finding with your customers? What are they enjoying? What are what's some feedback that or buzzwords that you're getting from your customers? All right. So going to this, so I think it's a little bit pretty subjective, you know, because like I can't really justify for everyone's, you know, point of view. But so we have a lot of guests as well who bring their sake with them, you know. So we, they have their bring their own sake, and so we have our bring our, bring your own wine, okay. So basically, like for our restaurant, like what I'm saying is, how do you say? I don't want to name any brands, but let's say our restaurant is really famous for wines, okay. Like the trend right now is, let's say, let's let's mention about Ewa Five, okay. It's because of Dom Perignon. So everyone who knows, like the guy, the ex winemaker from Dom Perignon, is. now doing sake and now for them they're big wine fanatics and it's a big thing you know people come in and the first thing that they mention 
is they didn't really mention about the quality. You know, what they mentioned is about the story behind E15, okay? So we don't really have such things. For example, like if me, if I was like talking to a sake song, I would mention about, you know, the rice polishing, where, where's the water from, like what kind of rice variety, what kind of like yeast is used. But here, like when the guest comes in, we don't really hear those technical things. Instead, what they say is like, oh yeah, you know, you know, this guy who's like making champagne from jumping is now making sake. And then it's like, everybody's like going a big buzz about it. I think it's all about for the guests, like what do they know? And then how to say, uh, that's how they relate to everything else. So like from wine, they go to sake. And then from there, like once they come in, they tell me, hey, Neil, have you been drinking, you know, a lot of sake recently? It's like, yeah, yeah, quite a few, quite a few. I mean, I try to drink at least like twice, twice a week, you know, so like that tried to control my alcohol and so on. But I'm like, yeah, I got this sake over here that I want you to try. It's like, uh, okay. Because like recently it was just like distributed in Singapore like probably a few months ago. And I was just like, oh, what is this sake? It's really intense, you know, like, yeah, this is E15. I was like, oh, what is it? So if I were not, if I'm not mistaken, it's like, this is the guy from, you know, John Perignon. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's the one. So, you know, you know, like we're big wine fanatics, you know, we come over here. So they talk about this like brands that they can relate. So this is more like to the guest perspective, okay? So it's always going to be different. So it's not from my own perspective because it's how they know this kind of stuff. So they will come in. It's like, yeah, I heard about this. I heard about that. Because like at the, at the end of the day, so how do you say, because they're like, they have, uh, uh, I think better marketing, you know, that's something I would say that, so there's a bigger brand awareness. But for me, there's a lot of good suckers out there. But the thing is like, we always tend to think about, you know, we mentioned about taxation in Singapore. So there's probably like a, a good amount of breweries that can actually go to Singapore. But the thing is when they see, you know, the taxation, it's just like, okay, it's going to be, you know, a bit too much or they can't really enter the market so what enters into the market is like uh those brands that people would recognize right away and then yeah so the list goes on and on and on but in terms of style so let's just uh, i'm going to stop with the branding so what uh they usually mention is all about the daiginjo and the june my daiginjo these are the first two things that will always come to mind they will not really mention about Futsushu and like all of those like uh, Ginjo, so on, like it added alcohol and so on, because these are the common things that you find. Like for them, it's easier to relate. Okay, I know Dai Ginjo. I know what is like uh, not, a, not a Dai Ginjo. I know what is like a Junmai style. So the, it's pretty simple for me. It makes my job a whole easier because I just need to differentiate like two styles because this, this, is, what the, this is what people want, you know? Yeah. Like if if I tell them like oh uh, guys have you you guys want you guys want to go for like a foot issue they're gonna be like uh is it a daiginjo that's the question it, the, their question is not what is foot issue but it's like is it a daiginjo is it a ginjo style so uh, like I'd make yeah. a point here just remove yeah. all that conversation yeah. just yeah. just take it out of the conversation yeah. just would you like an amazing sake that I think is going to be perfect for pairing with your yeah. With your, with, because I do believe burnt ends is specializes because it's steak, a uh, uh, barbecue mm. and steak, right? Yeah, so, you know, we do. You can just say, look, I've got something that's going to like be killer with like, an umami booster for your steak. Yeah, right now. I think all, yeah. perhaps sometimes a little bit of information can be a slippery yeah. slope. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was gonna so make, we, you're mentioning before Neil, sort of about the the need for sort of that story, and people want to know, they want to have exactly the story they can latch mm. onto. I'm curious, so then, you know, say somebody comes and say, I know I've heard the name of this famous person that's making this sake product, or I know yep. this is a big joke, but you know you have other tools at your disposal. I'm sort of curious, how do you then, knowing that you have a lot of other great mm -hmm. tools available, how do you usher those people in other directions? What, maybe not necessarily from one sake to another sake, but from the wine to another bottle of sake, to a glass mm -hmm. of sake. What's, what's sort of your proposal in there? What does that look like, ushering people into, the, into that world? So a lot for me, is, it's all about knowing your guests as well, okay? So you need to know whether this guest will, how do you say it, will appreciate like something a bit more different, you know? So you always need to read them as well because like there's some guests, for example, like, uh, like for, based on my experience, like I did a wine pairing. So it's just like wine, 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 and so on. And then came the crab dish. And they were like, what is this? I should just try it. You know, it's all about building suspense, you know? That's, that's how I do like an approach for them. Like every time we do a wine pairing for them, like there's something I've tried before, but I can't recall what, what is it called. Just have a try and then tell me what you think about it. 
then they try to they try that beverage they were like oh this is really amazing but what is this stuff and then, yeah, that's what we call you know uh, if it's Japanese sake and then from there so it was just only like how do you say it? it was only the entry level sake that I had and then from there like you build your sales you're gonna be I want to try like the best sake that you have over here so I think it's not only about uh, how do you say like giving them like uh, uh, the basic stuff like say my wife so on it's all about letting them experience because there's some guests who's a little bit more afraid you know like you tell them but if you surprise them you build suspense it becomes a different kind of story which makes it a whole lot more appreciative of it and then from your glass of sake becomes a premium bottle of sake so that's how that's how we do it over there so it's like all about you know building suspense building surprises as well but it's all about you know reading your guests at the same time so that's how we do it in Britain. I think your comments are really great, um, you know, takeaway for anyone out there in the FNB community who is also in a similar position as Neil, who's front of house, um, looking at ways to um, expand and enhance, I guess, um, experience, because actually the tasting menu and, and pairings for a tasting menu are a great, great way to unannounced slip in a sake. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be heralded because everyone's expecting a different beverage with each course. Doesn't need to be heralded, doesn't need to be prefaced by this has got this polishing rate and it's got this grade. You just slip it in and it's there for the purpose of the pairing and the appreciation. And so the guest will judge the sake based on the aroma and flavor rather than a preconceived idea of what is going to be served to them so Neil that's a really really what you're doing is, is, is honestly that's great advice for the F&B yeah. you know world absolutely mm. here I'm going to present you with five mm. fantastic options mm. one, one of them just don't, happens yeah. to be something else that don't mention that yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's all about building surprises suspense you know yeah exactly because when you're especially a restaurant of your caliber you're all about flavor. You're all about delivering the best combination of ingredients and beverages so that the end consumer, the customer, your guest, can have the most elevated experience. So in some ways, with a, with a pairing menu, you can be a bit stealth. <laughs> um, but then it's also really important, as you're saying, Neil, to also be able to back it up and have some narrative yeah. if there are questions mm. for us to be able to, rather than talk about polishing rates and technical um, processes, talk about something that's more, you know, humane. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, people can relate to, actually. You yeah, know, you yeah. need to go down to their level of understanding. That's the only way you can get touch points from them. You can't go from that level, and people will just, oh, what is this guy talking about? But if you go to that level, build that relation, build that momentum, then it escalates from there. It basically, it makes your job a whole lot easier. So I'm really curious about in the restaurant, what kind of glassware um, are you serving sake and, and then throw this to the rest of the team. I mean, is, is there, what, how do Singaporeans or the Singapore market tend to drink sake and um, what are your observations, especially uh, Sean, in regards to the crossover between wine glasses and drinking sake. So we'll start with you, Neil. How are you using um, glassware? For sake, so as, as we mentioned, so like before I serve an actual sake, what I would ask him is like, would you guys prefer it in like an ochoco cup, like an actual traditional sake cup, or do you want to have like a wine glass? Those are always two propositions. I don't want to keep it at three because it's a little bit too complex for them. So just like a 50, 50 percent. Oh, yeah, I want to have the traditional one. So it always depends on the experience as well. So you need to elevate or you either need to like go down to that level. Like, OK, I'm pretty fine with wine glass. I want to smell the aromas and so on. But you have some traditionalist who comes in. You know, I've been to Japan many times, you know, blah, blah, blah. I might as well like do the actual experience and get it from that actual cup. You will see a lot of those guests because sometimes I have some colleagues who doesn't literally like, you know, uh, because our normal routine is just do a wine glass, okay? But sometimes like they put a wine glass and then, uh, you know, my guest is telling me about this kind of cup. You know, they, you know, it's hard because they didn't really went to like sake education. Like, oh, what is this, you know, smoke? Oh, the old trip. Okay, let me go to the guest and then that's how we're going to do it. So it, I always try to present at least two options for like, in terms of like serving it to, to the guests right away. So over to you, um, Sean, um, obviously as an educator, how are you approaching glassware um, or 
or sake wear in general? Well, in general, I think, you know, we take nothing away from tradition because that's, ochoko is it's, it's kind of like go-to for, for most people. And when the general consumer or the layman, when they think about sake, it's always that, that, that cup. But in terms of perception, I think, well, if, you, if it comes to Westerners, let's, let's just put it that way. Uh, Westerners, when they think about short cups, it always gives them a feel of like um, how you would take a tequila or, you know, via shots. And that might not give a very good, uh, or, you know, a very prime impression of what the drink is. So considering it as a, the next connoisseur beverage, I think the wine glass is still the best. And what Neil is doing is, is absolutely, you know, is, is on point because I think he's giving an option for people to choose. Uh, what I would do in addition to that is actually to recommend that, you know, having a wine glass uh, might, might actually enhance the, uh, the, the flavors, the aromas, the experience in general, because it's very much like a wine, you know, with, with really good aromatics. And I think, and you know, if I'm if I was going to tie in a particular brand, you know, Rito has been doing a great job with with uh, curating a selection of um, sake glasses. So that's my take on on sake vessels. And also, um, restaurants that are non non Japanese restaurants might find sa serving sake inhibitive if they have to buy a whole new set of glassware, right? If they have to buy a whole new hardware it's going to make sake even more of a hurdle to absorb into their, um, into their restaurant. It's creating more costs and et cetera. So that's, that's really interesting what you're doing. How about you, um, Eugene? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, um, for us, it's kind of twofold. It really, it really depends on, on the, uh, the avenue of the, of the dinner. For example, um, if, if it's a, you know, if it's an izakaya or a, or a sushi, uh, most customers would expect uh, an ochoko. In fact, they, they enjoy this little procession of, of the, uh, of the floor staff bringing them a tray of, of, they bring them a tray of glasses and you choose which glass you want. You know, every, none of the glasses match. They got different colors and stuff. So that's a little bit of this, this pro procession that they enjoy. They appreciate it. I mean, it gives them this feeling of uh, of, of authenticity of, of oh, I'm, I'm, it feels like I'm in Japan. I'm having Japanese food, having Japanese sake and, and Japanese sake wear. So that's that's from one angle. And then there are other angles with some of the fine dining restaurants, um, especially non-Japanese restaurants. And um, I've done certain like pairing events in, in hotels, banquet style, where I've insisted that we serve in wine glasses. And for one of the single reasons is to just open their minds that this is, uh, you know, we're not in Japan. We're not specifically doing Japanese things, uh, eating Japanese food, but this is a Japanese product and it can be enjoyed out of that context. Um, so it, it's interesting because when you do that, two things happen. Uh, the first thing is some people get taken aback. Oh, am I insulting Japan by not drinking it in uh, Ochoko and not, drinking sake with sushi and sashimi did i just piss off the brewer so that's that's one thing that's one thing to yeah am i doing it wrong right are they gonna you know is, is he gonna shoot me from from japan so that's one thing and then the second then the second reaction is you have guests going i've never had it this way before i've never had sake in a wine glass it's amazing and i've never had sake with uh you know uh uh, uh a, a pasta. Or I've never had sake with, with, uh, with a French style, uh, you know, light fish uh, uh, and foie gras. So these these two things happen, and that really opens their mind. Uh, and I think that's that's one of the efforts. So it's not so much that one is better than the other, and I, I think they're both complementary, and they can both exist uh, together. So um, yeah, that would be that would be my experience in that. Hey, Eugene, I'm just letting you know that Jason Kwan's online, so... Um, I know, I see his text. <laughs> <laughs> big shout out to Jason, thanks for your support. Um, well, actually, um, Eugene, you touched on my favourite subject, which is uh, dining out in Singapore, and I had the pleasure of dining out at um, some of uh, Singapore's, you know, top restaurants, 
so rated mm -hmm. by, I'm not going to name them, various guides and ranking lists. <laughs> and a two-star Michelin restaurant, I was served uh, four sake yeah. during my, it was a very long course. Um, there were also wine, but I was yeah. served four sake and I think I picked up another one towards the end. So I was really amazed that mm -hmm. a restaurant that was not Japanese, was actually uh, Nordic, um, was serving sake without announcement as yeah. part of the appearing menu. And then we also um, went to a one-star Michelin French mm -hmm. restaurant that had sake on its mm -hmm. menu. Um, so I was pretty blown away that mm -hmm. there was this penetration in the high-end um, dining market in Singapore. But my knowledge of, if you think of food in Singapore, mm -hmm. you think hawker market, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So how does, I mean, you've got this incredible um, food-focused gourmet culture where people dine out most nights of the week. Um, how, how do you see Singapore, what is the, in terms of restaurants, what is the potential for sake to penetrate the market in different um, sort of market positions? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, guys. Uh, well, if, if you want me to go first? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. <laughs> uh, I think it's it's twofold. I mean, one is, I mean, there is definitely this greater acceptance now of, of sake. Uh, again, with with the help and work of, of people like Sean and Neil, um, it's educating the SOMs, educating the restaurant managers, educating restaurant owners on how sake can contribute to their top line. Uh, at the end of the day, everybody's a businessman. You know, we're generally all Chinese businessmen in Singapore, and we need our businesses to work. So it's the, it's this um, not so much convince them that sake is a great experience, but convince them that this is really going to help uh, your your customer experience and help your customer to to enjoy your restaurant and to come back. Um, and then the second thing is again um, to help move sake out of Japanese restaurants and into more international cuisine, more local cuisine. I mean, today you can bring wine into any restaurant, any cuisine, and nobody will bat an eye. You can drink French wine in, in Korean, in an Indian restaurant, uh, in, in street food, nobody will blink an eye. But you say bringing, bring a bottle of sake to an Italian restaurant and people go like, what? Are you crazy? No, we're going to have Italian wine in an Italian restaurant. So that's, uh, I think that's, that's the perception that were, at least I, I would like to assist, to contribute, to, to, to improve. So maybe somebody, maybe Sean. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, writing on, on Eugene's point on perception, uh, because we were talking about vessels earlier and using, using uh, wine glasses as a vessel actually kind of elevates the category as, as, as a whole. Um, pertaining to having sake in a non-Japanese restaurant or even in a hawker center or just having hawker food because that is our local cuisine. I've heard of uh, inquiries of, of friends or, you know, people in the trade asking, hey, you know what, what do you think of serving uh, draft sake uh, in one of these um, hawker centers? What, do you think it will work? I think it's kind of revolutionary. Uh, it's big and bold move. I'm not even sure whether it might might totally work, but it could. With the right kind of uh, communication, it might work. And I think for brewers, from, from the brewer's perspective, they don't have to worry that, uh, is, this a, is, this, is this one step forward, two steps back? Because I'm going to serve it in a, 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 a low-cost uh, arena, you know, with, with, with food that's not fine dining or what. But think about it, I mean, different brewers have, have, uh, have different entry levels, I mean, different levels of uh, products. So there is sake for everyone at every level. So I don't think there's going to be a clash or anything. Over to Neil. All right. So this is going to be a lot of pressure to be right now. So <laughs> anyway, so how do we penetrate? So what I think is like, there's a lot of like memes right now for how to do it. So, uh, so I have a lot of friends as well. How do you say it let's say through social media? I think this is a new channel that how we can, you know, expand on like people's knowledge, people's awareness about sake. Because it, times weren't like the same as before. Like you only get to know sake if you have it, you know, if you actually have the product. But now it's changing because like you have a lot of technology. People do a lot, you know, social media following and then they see me as a wine guy who drinks, like, you know, basically alcohol, whiskey, wine, and so on and starts to drink sake. 
And then they're going to be like, oh, what is so special about that cake? You know, and then that's where you start to build like, you know, brand awareness, like uh, start to build curiosity about people like, okay, uh, this guy's doing sake for some reason. There has to be, you know, like, some, I mean, it's all about creating the proper influences, proper touch points to it as well. So like from there, people would say, okay, what, what is this? What is, what is just sake? Like, what's so crazy about it? It's like, for me, it's like, okay, go online. You know, you can do a lot of things. I, I would divert into like Eugene and then someone's, oh, you can go for Mr. Otaro. He has, you know, a uh, great collection. You guys want to know more about sake? Go to my sensei, you know, <laughs> Mr. Sean over here. So I would tell them it's not, it's not, not, it's not all about me like knowing about these things, but I, I knew it from friends and from friends. And then from there, it's like basically a network of trees that starts to build up and build up and build it and so on. I think from that, we, we start something small. We start like, we have our own sake community as well. So from a small sake community, it spans and who knows, like next, probably next year, we're going to be like one of the biggest, you know, uh, sake representation, uh, you know, worldwide, you know, outside of Japan. Yep, that's it for me. Well, Neil, well, I'm hands. looking forward to coming to your restaurant and finding out for myself. Right, exactly. um, as soon as they <laughs> open those damn borders and reduce that quarantine time, I'm there. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to that, Rebecca. Just send me a message. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, look, gentlemen, it's been amazing. Um, you've given us incredible insight to your really Fabulous little market. It's a little market, but it's it's a market that can. It's, 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 it's one that it's one that a lot of people, a lot of breweries care about. Yeah, absolutely, and one that I think that is, in many ways, while it's small, it's leading the charge in, in innovation and um, open mindedness. And as um, all of you have touched on, is about developing you, the Singaporean market's um, appreciation and valuing of sake through um, giving people a story-based narrative, a high-end experience, not necessarily in terms of price point, but in terms of care and support and taking care of your customer and making sure that they're having the best experience they can with their sake and their food or their environment, as well as creating a network, creating a network for sharing information um, so that you can all grow. Um, I think that's what you're doing over there is really fantastic. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Gentlemen. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, I know things are a little, a little hectic at the moment, a lot, a lot mm -hmm. of challenges out there, and I, I appreciate you all making time um, and staying up with us tonight and joining mm -hmm. us here at the moment. Yeah, Bye, so cheers, guys. <laughs> take care, stay safe, and we hope to see you very, very soon. Thank you, right. Come gentlemen. Come we're, we're pleasure. Come by. Come by. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Take care out there. All right. Take care, too.